Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, Carolyn Hauser here, and I have a guest today, my friend Lisa Starr. Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited and very glad that I can be bringing um, this series to you. My intention for these calls, always on the first um, Wednesday of the month going forward, is to bring you people that have kind of walked the journey, that have a history of sexual abuse, and that have found ways to integrate, heal, and move towards wholeness, into wholeness. And so today, Lisa, she, she lives here in Santa Barbara, where I am. She is been immersed in the world of the Mayan teachings and natural time, and um, I've been in in friendship with her for over three years now, and it's been really helpful to me to be introduced to this philosophy, especially um, around healing and um, empowering myself by knowing energy patterns. So I'm not the expert to talk about this today. Lisa, is, she has written a book, which she'll introduce today too. Um, yeah, it's going to be an interview style, and um, at the end, there is time for questions, if there are questions. So you can just sit back, relax. There will be a recording. Or you can listen to it later again, and um, we'll have an interview style conversation around how to empower ourselves using natural time um, if we've been through sexual um, trauma as children. So welcome, Lisa. Hi. Hi. I'm excited. <laughs> awesome, me too. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to the teaching and how it's helped you? Okay. Let's see. So one of the ways I describe myself is that I'm a second generation scholar in this particular lineage and I like to really give full acclaim to the original teacher who was Jose Arguelles and he was a Mexican American raised in Minnesota, who went on his own personal odyssey to find his Mexican Central American roots. And there he discovered the Maya. But he always had a really strongly mystical approach to unrooting his history and his connection to this spiritual prophecy and, and daily sacred count that come out of that territory. And so he became as much a, a channel as an archaeologist or an anthropologist, and he developed natural time, which is really taking the Mayan cycles, their calendar cycles, but, you know, they have anglicized names, and there are some more describing energies that he brought to it, and we can follow the original Mayan cycles using the English language and uh, sort of global mythology is incorporated to the original Mayan pictures. So that was uh, presented to me when I was like 15 years old. And my mother was this countercultural Northern Californian, and she was really deep into following Jose. And I never actually followed him. But when I was about 33, which I call Christ age, I came round to what she had been doing for 20 years through my own children who are interested in their grandmother's path. And so I've been doing this for more than 10 years, almost 13. And uh, that means studying it every day and being with the shamanic teachings of each day. And I, I often tell people who have no idea about the Mayan daily calendar that it's very strongly like the, the Greek and Roman mythology where there were many gods on Olympus and there are many temples and people move from temple to temple to honor the, the different gods and to keep them pleased or at peace in the heavens. And the Maya had, you know, many different ways of, of paying reverence to the divine world and we do it day by day. So it's, it's similar that there's, you know, there was the goddess of love and the god of war, and here we have different day names that hold different archetypes, and we balance our lives by following each one in turn. Um, and then I have a whole different history, which is more on the theme of what you're bringing to people around, uh, you know, total trauma and <laughs> having my life initiated and uprooted by early pain and having to integrate that in my body, in my heart, in my in my being, my spiritual center. So that's why I'm drawn to, to talk with you today and, and to really orient my path, path in natural time to how it's helped me heal from 
yeah, from some cultural horrors that are really typical for our modern civilization. I love also how in you know in your personal story, um, your daughters actually reconnected you kind of to the teaching of your mother because so much of our healing has to do with you know healing the connection to our mothers and then moving forward um, having a healed relationship with our daughters. Yeah. Yeah. So how specifically um, you know did you use the the teaching to help you with your trauma? Well, I'm going to start actually with a trauma that's not. I mean, I'm a sexual abuse survivor, and but maybe to illustrate, you know, how I was helped from the calendar, I'll start with a different trauma, which was probably an echo of that original wounding. But I had uh, one child and then another with the same partner, and when my younger daughter was just an infant. Uh, my ex-husband, their father, chose to leave. And it was so disruptive in terms of stability for being a parent and for watching children grow up with one parent when there had been two. That that was what I described as, you know, entering a war, like a modern picture of being in the trenches of World War I where it's unimaginable when parenting with two it almost seems like, oh, it could be better if I didn't have this conflicted marriage, if this partnership, which brings me so much pain, weren't here. I could parent so much more easily. I could just do what I want. And I had to really learn humility about those wishes that I had made to be on my own because being alone parenting a baby and a, and a young daughter also was catastrophically unstable. And it pretty much stirred all the earlier instabilities. In that way, it was a gift because it brought to light, you know, that I really wasn't whole at my center, that there had been an early, early fracturing. So I want to just say that the calendar came into my life and the spiritual practice that's rooted in that day-by-day practicing and um, developing honoring and reverence each waking day, that helped me get any kind of balance back, any hope and faith when I was physically, emotionally exhausted from this dilemma that happens all the time. To me, it's just another kind of, you know, modern wounding for women. Even if we co-create unstable relationships and co-create children from them and are bound to be separated, it's really hard. It's not, I think it's overlooked that it's really hard to raise children alone. I mean, it isn't if you're doing it, but maybe from the outside it can't be explained until it's happening. So anyway, that was when I came into this day-by-day practice and the illumination and magic of all these. You know, the Mayan calendar orients us to magical mythological archetypes each day, and so it turns life into kind of uh, a fairy tale walk, and I don't mean with a happy ending. I mean, fairy tales really have a lot of challenge and <laughs> feats to overcome and there are dark forces that pull us off our path and that's kind of how it felt to enter this as a spiritual discipline because I had already lived a sort of mythological life with its horrors and shadows and so this has given name to it and it's given a celebration uh, to that. And then, yeah, I'll jump back just to be factual and I welcome your inquiry about what you think might be of interest to people. I didn't remember until I was in the middle of my 30s that I had been sexually abused by my father's father. And the way that I remembered it was when I was training to do body work. So it was in my body and through some exchange or a series of intense workshops to learn modalities, it kind of volcanically ruptured and the memory came fast, and physically I had a very strong physical reaction that kind of proved and upheld to me that it was real. It wasn't some kind of, you know, metaphysical picture of invasion. And I felt in that moment, and I'd already been studying natural time for a while, I felt thrilled to finally have an answer to why I was, quote, unquote, an unhappy child or an unstable human being that that original shock and confusion and disorientation had stayed with me, but now I could point to, you know, substantiate that there there was a cause. And that was probably when I was three, uh, 
because he died, and I'm lucky that he did when I was four. I just want to I just want to pause here for a moment and um, really thank you for sharing this story because I know from my own from my own um, remembrance and just from talking with many women that um, oftentimes you know when we have mem- mental memories. We doubt it because there, you know, there's just no proof. We've been, we were so young when this happened. But to really trust in our body and and working with the reaction that our body has and the story that our body tells, because our body remembers the truth, and we always have access to those stored memories in our body through feeling, and, and that's a lot of you know the work that I do and, and teach, and you probably use in your work. So I just want to thank you for sharing this and also um, give it as a piece of you know empowering um empowerment to really stay with what's true for you and your body you know nobody else needs to to um attest to it that you you are the one that knows because it's in your body mm-hmm. yeah it, it really <laughs> it helps to talk to other people that have been through it versus family members that don't believe it because i fully come from a family that I guess the quote was, well, I believe that you think it's true, but that's not something that I can see as possibly true. And the nice thing about being a pretty evolved adult by the time that I remembered is that I knew that I didn't have to prove it to anybody because the revelation was giving me so much freedom that 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 was enough. And at the same time, on a human level, it isn't very fun. I mean, to me, sexual abuse is one of the, most pivotal intersections in a life, you know, in this modern culture. Yeah. Once that happens to me, life is just bent down this other path, which might have greater compassion because I feel it's it's a point of suffering different than war and famine. It's a first world suffering, and it's frequent in our first world. And it, to me, I do say that I was initiated to be a sensitive person, to be shamanically oriented, meaning looking deeper than surface experience for for meaning. So I love finding others who've been, you know, turn left here, here's your fate, your karmic destiny, we're all together. And then the family members who have a denial around it, they have their own path. So that's really a beautiful part to me about the truth telling and being really open about the experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, the more we can allow ourselves to tell the truth and talk the truth, um, we allow others to do the same. And eventually, you know, which is my really my big mission is to create a world where this is not happening anymore, where children can, you know, be children, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, everyone lives in their power and doesn't need to do these things to feel p- powerful or you know feel feel anything at all. So. We're on the we're on the same page. Yeah, it's fun. I'd like to sort of add in there that I felt also because I had I had come to a place in my life where I understood the potential for being what we call a perpetrator, and I don't yeah. specifically mean that around sexual abuse, but I had certainly because of my single mother status and the overwhelm that I felt that triggered a lot of uh, instability in my parenting. Yeah. And so I was far from perfect, and in fact, I have created damage in my children from what I've had to manage and healing and how that means that on some days everything falls apart before it's put back together in a new, uh, yeah, a re reparented way. So as I'm trying to parent myself differently, I'm often failing with my children, and so I understood loss of control and being cruel and being inappropriate on emotional levels. And so I would say that I immediately understood my grandfather not as, you know, an evil demon, but someone who was possessed. And I could from, you know, I'm an intuitive, I'm a clairvoyant as part of my practice, and I I immediately understood that he had come out of this himself, that he had learned it from it happening to him. I'm as certain of that as the experience that I had. And so I saw myself as connected to someone who was, in fact, a victim who didn't have the tools to 
heal, and so it perpetuate another generation. And all my struggle or um, self motivation is, well, could I work on myself enough so that my children are spared that alignment or allegiance with me by having it happen to them? And I think that that's worked. <laughs> You know, we can't know because things can happen out of our control as parents, but I think so. Yeah. And, I'm so, you know, I'm so glad you're bringing all of this up because, for me, I really started to realize that I had much more work to do when I started, you know, that yelling at my children and when I started just, like you were describing, uh, you know, going to the other side and becoming, I could see myself becoming a perpetrator. You know, I was right on the borderline and I could, like, see how when somebody doesn't have the resources, you know, how easily you can you can fall into becoming a perpetrator because there's just nothing that, that holds you that, that, you know, and it's so, so wired in, in your in your nervous system and, and your being, if that's what you, you know, what comes from your lineage. So thank you for bringing this up and, and this is part of the truth. And, you know, in, in public or in the media, you don't hear this. You know, nobody talks about this and I'm really... Um, making it my mission to talk about this, educate people about this, so that the judgment can, you know, the judgment of the bad guy, the victim, can go away and we can start healing everybody that's involved. It's a dysfunction that, that's going on, you know, amongst everybody and not just the sick the sick guys are doing it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you so much for bringing this up. It's interesting. I always, like, I have a lot of humility around this particular part of my life and so when I listen to you say all that back I do want to say to those listening or you know anyone I meet on my path I was saved because my grandfather died and he died of a stroke and he died uh, you know shortly after the time I identify the trauma happening and so it wasn't sustained who knows if it would have continued or if it was more than one time but I was guarded and guided by an angelic field that lifted him right into the heavens. They took him over. And so I don't know what it's like to have to live with sustained abuse or live in the presence of a perpetrator and forgive them. My forgiveness came 30 years later with someone who had been dead for 30 years who was very clearly to me accessible as an angelic presence himself and deeply sorry and atoning by being a a guardian once he crossed over. So I just have to like, I mean, I feel very fortunate for the amount of sensitivity I have and how I was affected by this incident or series of incidents. I'm also lucky. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that, that exists. Yes. Um, in no way or shape, you know, do, do I nor do you want to uh, diminish the, the wrongness of abuse and the impact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, well, it makes me feel like I should I should talk a little about natural time because yeah. that's sort of what I I realize the whole premise is that I want to bring people uh, an awareness of another piece that's available in terms of embodied spirituality because the more embodied I am in my spiritual reverie, the more healing between the wounded physical body and my heart and I really have a clear sense that in my trauma, I just left my body and I stayed out for years to navigate um, pain. And so I have been consciously trying to re-inhabit my body vitally so that my cells are vital and I'm healthy in my physicality and my sexuality. And natural time is just something that I offer as, you know, it's not a concept. It, the Maya and other indigenous cultures were extremely virally and vibrantly in their physical forms. And so it's nice to call back. I mean, yoga is the same, just practices that come from ancient times before this kind of technological disconnect between our physical selves and how we earn money. Like, you know, if you're a farmer, you earn money by being very physically close to the earth. And women who are mainly rearing children are very close to that physical reality and so now when we work in the workforce it's more distant and that's been centuries so yeah I want to just throw out that natural time is called natural time and so the Mayan calendar because it's more diverse than just the Maya it's a call back to 
using nature as a spiritual sustenance. So that, yeah, a God exists however we perceive it, but many of us find miracles in how nature just keeps regenerating. Like, it's a dark winter, but then spring comes and a light returns, and in us is this innate animal response of hope and excitement and, yeah, sort of tremulous um, inspiration. And so natural time is basically a way to recall that a calendar that when we follow a day-by-day calendar, we can fall back in alignment with nature instead of having artificial clocks and calendars that don't have a reference to nature anymore. And that's a part, I mean, you know, I'm not going to give a big lengthy treatise here, but if I could impart anything, it's just to be aware that our Gregorian calendar, which is the world standard, is, you know, has been changed and altered bureaucratically for so many centuries that it doesn't have an actual reference to anything astronomical anymore except that it tracks one orbit around the sun in 365 days. But it doesn't, the months which are named as a reference to the word moon don't refer to the moon cycle. And there are other abnormalities in the in the arrhythmic count of 30 and 31 days. And so there's this whole theory that if we live by an irregular calendar count, that we create a disharmonious energy field in our beings. And that's, to me, that's very believable. <laughs> you know, but it's, I'm not asking anyone else to be as much of a believer, but just, you know, take into account how it's hard to figure out what month it is and how many days they're in it without remembering it by rote, whereas an indigenous calendar was rhythmic and connected to the moon and sun and stars and our physical body's response to those those movements, which is where I get excited about healing physical trauma or emotional um, unhappiness that lives in our bodies as holding because the more I can feel physically connected to nature and physically connected to the big picture of the astronomy and the celestial world, the more alive I am. And that's been my whole healing process from from abuse. Is that, that, I mean, that's like a picture of death when someone sort of takes over my life force with their largeness and their dark energy. That felt like dying. And to remember it was many echoes of death and suicidal tendency. And then this is all about reversing that and just saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, like a flower, I'm alive, like the rainstorm, I'm alive. And, you know, like the new spring, I'm reborn. Um, I love how, you know, the natural time and living with the calendars is really an invitation to be in sensation and to experience life as a, you know, or the day's time, you know, as a, a a uh, fluid river of different energies. You know, that, that's my layman description, but I just love it because you really need to be in your body to experience this and live this. And once you do, like you said, you this whole other world opens up to you, you know, the sacred and, and unseen forces that are there all the time that we keep forgetting because we're so busy. Busy. Yeah. 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 Well, there's... To me, also, like, coming out of any kind of childhood trauma, physical or sexual abuse or others, I mean, for the longest time, I thought my childhood trauma was my parents divorcing and being very hostile to each other. And I kind of built a huge resentment about that, and that was another part of the relief of going, no, there was much, much more invasive trauma that I was projecting then onto the divorce. But whatever our history is around pain, Ah, it's really, uh, rigidity seems to be one of the responses. Muscular tension, controlling personalities, um, having maybe over-exaggerated boundaries and being very reactive when something seems to be coming at us as an attack, being sensitive to criticism. And so the undoing of that, I have all of those, <laughs> and the undoing of that to me is day-by-day day adjustment to what is happening in the present moment. And I wasn't succeeding at doing that through all the spiritual teachings want us to be present. But to sit in meditation for long hours was asking way too much of myself. 
Um, and so I found this other way that's much more creative and childlike and imaginal. That's really what the Maya, to me, offer in the world canon of spirituality is that they were extremely visually colorful and rich the same way, you know, we see that in 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 Mexico now and how they embrace Catholicism and there are all these colors and kind of comic gestures. They use skeletons and they have celebrations where all these death images are made out of candy. And then if we take Frida Kahlo and her artistry as one emblem of that part of the world, it's so dreamlike and surreal. And so the Mayan teachings as a spiritual path allow this kind of dreamy, imaginal wandering that I associate with being a child before logic and order are implemented and know we have to actually channel our minds and harness them towards a goal. This is so much like living a waking dream or being allowed to daydream to follow the Mayan day signs. That has really restored the childhood that, you know, the childhood innocence that was lost because of the hardship of my initiation. And that's just another way it, it becomes like an embodied healing because the more I can think like a child, the more my body starts to reclaim the looseness of a child, a child who hasn't been forced into kind of a rigid reaction. And it kind of makes me want to like throw out some day signs so that people start to get an idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, we're talking yeah. about the, we're talking about the next time. Do you, do you want me to jump in with that? Sure, sure. Yeah, like so. Hello, new listener to the to the Mayan picture. I mean, I want you to know that you were born within this calendar that I'm about to give some examples of. So when I give examples of the days as they unfold, please understand that it's an astrology, and each one of us is born in one of these days, and we embody this select uh, energy field and this mythological archetype for our whole lives. And usually when I tell people, because I look people's birthdays up all the time, whether I'm, you know, buying hardware or gasoline, I'm I'm often, if I have an extended chat with someone, I'll inquire about their birthday. And when I impart it, people seem to respond as if it resonates. Yeah, I mean, that's so, how, how we first connected, you know, but I remember we ran into each other at the Family Constellation uh, Conference and... During a break, you just said, hey, what's your birthday? And, you know, that was the start. (laughs) Great. That's true. I remember it specifically. Right. Well, so there are are 20 different possibilities. There are 20 days that cycle one cycle after another. So within the cycle are 20 orientations, and they're matching each finger and toe. So the Maya were counting on their bare feet and their bare hands because they could in that climate. And that's already embodiment, that these live in our extensions, our farthest extensions from our heart. And uh, the the 20 tribes are oriented to, to different colors that point to different directions in the medicine wheel. But I thought I would just say the, the noun, the, the tribe energies, all 20 of them, so people get an idea of the archetypes. So we start with dragon, which was crocodile for the Maya, dragon, and then wind, and then night, like the night sky, which is Carolyn, and yellow seed. I'm sorry, I just added a color, but let's say seed, the seed that becomes a flower. Serpent, the first animal is serpent. Uh, And then we celebrate death, but we call it world bridger because death is a bridge between worlds. It's not an ending. It's an opening to the afterlife. And then hand, hands that we extend out from our hearts, and star, celebrating the stars in the sky, moon. Moon is also the water and how it's influenced by the moon's forces. Then dog, another animal, and monkey, another animal, and human, another animal. <laughs> it's really great to remember in this cosmology that Humans are animals, so they come, they flow from serpent to dog to monkey. Then we come along. Uh, Skywalker, which is an homage to the prophet, but it's also corn. Corn is the original Mayan word for this day because it it grows into the sky like a prophet does, going and getting messages and then feeding people with them. 
uh, after Skywalker is Wizard, the Sorcerer, and then Eagle, another animal past us that can actually fly and lift off to, to get closer to Creator. And then Yellow, well, the Warrior, the Fighter, the one who wears a shield and defends us. And Earth, we celebrate Earth, and it's it's very shifting nature, not that it's solid and hard, but that it has lava eruptions and seismic shifts. And mirror, which is a celebration of the, the ritual of sacrifice in many indigenous worlds. They made offerings to the gods, so we have a day to do our version of that. And then storm, and then sun. And today is a sun day. Even though we're calling it Wednesday, it's sun day in this sacred count. So just hear all those array of possibilities and imagine that they create a circle and that we move around the circle and in placing our intention or our reverence on each of these figures, these concepts, these energies, we live a balanced life where no one and no gratitude is left out. And to me, in my recovery path, gratitude for what I have is the counterbalance for resentment of what happened. The resentment is really draining even though legitimate reactive pain is part of my release and healing, having ideas that something is bad does not give me freedom. And so I, f I focus as much as possible on, like, wow, these are the miracles that have happened. And each day in this sacred count invites us to, to be thankful and aware of the, the miraculous president, presence of, of these energies that keep us alive. So I would I would uh, let everyone know <laughs> from my healing perspective that I was born on a day called Storm, and the Storm Day is all about the energy needed to clear the sky back to pure sunlight. And so I really accept within my my own karmic history of the family I was born into and the circumstance around my grandfather's sort of mental and emotional illness, spiritual illness, and how he targeted me with his frustration with himself, that my role is to speak the truth of my experience and try to get myself, my children, those who love me, out of denial, primarily myself and my kids. This happened. It was catastrophic. I've survived it. I'm all right. I'm a more sensitive, alive person for having suffered. I have deep compassion for all levels of suffering because of my experience. And, and yeah, my storm, my understanding of myself as a storm means I'm clearing my own system, my family system, back to connection to sunlight, to the warmth of creator as it touches me. So that's one way I've uh, used the calendar to have self-understanding of why I went through this big catalytic, yeah, it was like thunder and lightning and a flood to have that early experience as a child. I, you know, I love all the, the pictures and the, the poetry of what you're bringing. <laughs> I could listen for this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for loving it because all I'm doing is imparting what I feel like I receive from, and everyone receives, uh, you know, a spiritual path differently. So I receive it this way and I impart it this way and it's it's made life like a storybook. You know, I can tell the story of my childhood and I can see the mythology within it, which makes it much more palatable. Yeah. Um, I think another piece that we had we had pre-discussed that if I uh, were speaking to survivors or people interested in that process of healing, that I could also explain how I've used the calendar to accept and understand my grandfather's perspective. Um, because what happens is I know his birthday 
and I know what he is through this lens. And his energy will roll through my energy and your energy, any of us. Every 20 days we come home to ourselves. So if I'm a storm person, when we come to the storm day, that's kind of a place of uh, reconnection to the source of, of my life experience. And then when we pass through other people's days that we know intimately or casually, we can feel into like, oh, this is what it's like to be them. So it's nice because it knocks out a lot of the narcissistic, you know, reaction like I can't leave my comfort zone. Because each day, even though I have a birth energy, I'm moving through other archetypal teachings and qualities. And I'm then able to use this as an astrology to say, oh, so-and-so is, a sun, it's a sun day, and wow, is this what they, how they view the world from inside this experience? So I had enough years of, of studying this whole paradigm to know, like, okay, my grandfather was a white wind, and I keep throwing the colors in, and I apologize if that confuses people. There's a color orientation to each of the tribes, and I've been trying to simplify. So, yeah, my grandfather is a white wind, and we can say a wind, and I'm a storm. And so there's a relationship between those two that we can imagine, that the wind, you know, moves the storm through the sky, so it touches a lot of different locations. The wind probably increases, you know, a storm is just a condensation of water molecules that explode ultimately from tension. We could say the wind maybe moves those together more densely, so there is a cathartic downpour. Uh, the storm itself makes the wind visible because the wind is pretty much invisible unless it has something that it can that it can change and transform. So we can't see the wind moving unless it's a cloud that it's pushing or leaves on the tree that are blowing. And I use that metaphor to understand my connection to my grandfather mythologically. That yeah, I made his his own weakness, his own suffering visible. And that he increased the tension until I fell apart. <laughs> and that the whole experience is allowing me as an adult through this story and the, he the healing I've done generally to be very comfortable moving through the world and sharing my experience. So that's one part. And we each have a different, you know, birth energy and a different relationship to our so-called perpetrator, our, our, yeah, our karmic nemesis. But I would love to be of service through my writing or uh, personally or teaching people how to, to look at the deeper resonances other than the superficial anguish. Um, and I have another piece to say, but I want to make sure that I don't talk endlessly if you have anything you want to interject. <laughs> no, I'm just curious now. You know, I know my energy, but I've never um, gotten the perpetrator piece, so I'll know what I'll do after the call. <laughs> Yeah. I'll definitely talk to you and find out. Yeah. Yeah, humanizing. I think that's where I began, you know, in terms of my recovery of my fractured self into wholeness. It's really about humanizing the suffering on both sides. How can I humanize what I went through and forgive myself for the failings that came out of that by being maybe a weakened person or a confused person, but how can I humanize the person that came after me? Because I really have the faith that if I don't humanize them, if I demonize them, I'm feeding the demonic aspect of my own shadow energy and it will get bigger. So this has been a way, I mean, the, the other part that I wanted to share is that, so now I, I told about the sort of mythological connection between wind and storm. Well, the wind days come every 20 days, and I have an opportunity to feel how am I doing in response to this singular energy field and how it recognizes this one person and his deep awkwardness <laughs> in approaching me. And I, you know, again, I've, I remembered and made the connection years ago, and it really helped me understand the discomfort of many wind passages. And now when wind passages approach, 
I really take time and space to feel my feelings. I don't jam a lot into the day because I'm on a conscious path of really becoming whole and regaining my innocence. And so I want to let the emotions that come up in response to his invasive energy originally and his healing energy since I want to have a recognition of it. So that's like kind of the pitch, like natural time doesn't mean that we don't do therapy, that we don't have honest conversations with other survivors, that we don't have many avenues for coming out of hiding and shame. But to me, it's sort of it's deeply metaphysical and energetic-based um, connection and non-resistance, a surrender to the original exchange between two people. So, I mean, it's terrible because one is old and powerful and manipulative and sort of damaged, and the other is possibly innocent and, you know, doesn't have a concept and becomes confused and hurt. But I like to also just say we're two souls navigating a human dilemma, and this is how we did it. And and what can I learn about this other soul and my response to it on these days that arise? Yeah, it's just it's 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 so beautiful, and you know that's to me it's the true empowerment when you can really um, step into that into that space where you where you soul to soul. And a lot of the work that um, the family constellation work that we both um, share, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of like the connecting connecting the connector where you know you really get to work with the soul, and so much more healing is possible when we are able to transform the, the ego space not the human space but really um claim that we're human beings that we have souls and that we're all in this together mm -hmm. yeah so thank you for saying that again yeah so. it's truly a treasure for me and i'm gonna i'm gonna admit that it's harder for me to find the soul <laughs> center of somebody i'm having a dispute with in present time than for me to find the soul center of my grandfather who was such a giant fate in my life. So again, I, I can listen to myself. I'm not actually able to live at this elevation of consciousness in an everyday, all relational way. But in terms of my first primal wounding, and again, I think I've said my initiation, I, I treat my grandfather <laughs> like a shaman who initiated me into the shadow world so that I could go on this mythic exploration and come out heroic for the challenges I've faced. And so, again, he's not alive. He's not still drunk and in my face. But but I guess working with that, with that primal scenario of assault and violation and healing It gives me hope that I will ultimately be able to find the people that eat in everyday walking around life irritate me. Um, I'll find them on a soul level too. That's my quest is to just. You know, and I think it's really. Yeah, sorry. sorry. I'll let you finish. No, I want you to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> I think it's really important for people to hear that they can be allowed to, you know, for a lot of us, it's. It was a close family member. It was his father. It was boyfriend of the mother. It was, in my case, it was boyfriend of my mother and my grandfather. And I honestly both liked them and loved them. And society does not allow me to do that. Society does not allow me to have those feelings. You know, society does not allow you to have those feelings um, generally. And, you know, there's both truths. I hated him. I was confused. And yet still I loved him and I still love him. And like you were sharing, my my grandfather also passed, and since his passing, um, he's been he's my biggest supporter, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the truth that I know is true for me. And maybe you know, if you're listening to this right now, you t you haven't allowed yourself to go there because, you know, it's just in our society, it it's where you don't dare to go. You know, it's it's it would question question everything that we know in our in our um. Um, judicial judicial system, yeah. you know. But the, for me, you know, the true healing and wholeness doesn't come from 
um, punishing somebody and locking them behind bars, although they need to take responsibility if they're still alive. But my true healing comes from, you know, really seeing the whole picture and saying, okay, this was wrong, yet there's also the other truth. This was a human being. And for that, you know, we're both the same. We're both human beings. I'm not a better human being or a you know, worse human being. Um, there's a level where we're the same, and then there's levels where we're not. So I really, like, a lot of, you know, the work that I do or what I want to impart and leave behind is that g coming away from the black and white and seeing that there's all kinds of possibilities in life and, and uh, truth. It's never just black and white. So I just wanted to, you know, say this uh, because we're two people saying this. It's not just me saying this, so that you listening can have permission to explore if this is true for you as well, you know, what we're sharing about having a soul connection and and maybe, you know, if your abuser has passed on to see if if he's there, if he's supporting you or she is there supporting you from the other side. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's beautiful when you speak about that. I have to take ownership for, you know, I have diffused a lot of, my anger or resentment at my grandfather himself, but my parents have had to feel it because they lived on and I was a little child with this buried resentment that kept bubbling out yeah. and it was directed at my living parents who did not sexually abuse me. Yeah. And they're still alive and I have plenty of issues, you know, in an everyday way around being near them. And, and so, again, I just always like to, take some responsibility that I can see a clear path and I have revelations and aspects of my life that I in expect to have integration <laughs> to do until the day I rise. I almost picture that dying is really the completion of the integration on some level and relief from this planetary realm. But I uh, certainly feel still, there's around sexual abuse there are all these, you know, radiations out and those who can't protect us because they don't know they need to yeah. take a lot of um, reactive blame and I have that in my family unconscious and conscious like why didn't you see in my suffering as a child that I wasn't just a messed up kid that there was a real original influence so I'm going to take away from this conversation we're having the need to really once again hold my parents and as I age, it's easier because we're just all old now <laughs> to say, wow, they just were doing the best they could. Because as I also said, the, the less resentment that I have, the more freedom I have, the more open my heart is instead of shrouded in fear, uh, just the more free I am every day to be. Like the sun and the moon and these other archetypes, as a human, I can also be a piece of beauty and a piece of the organic world. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I just love these free flow conversation when, you know, you can have a goal in mind or an idea and then it just evolves to something so powerful and completely different. And I'm really grateful for all the things that have been said and um, have been uh, brought to awareness today through this dialogue. <laughs> so I wanted, to, I wanted to leave a little time at the end where, you know, for you to tell people where they can, you know, find you, work with you if they desire to do so. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I know I, before I talk about that, I want to just describe that this particular conversation also reflects the day to me it does, the day that we're speaking within. And this is a sun day. It would be called a yellow sun day. And it really is the arrival and enlightenment, uh, the 20 different tribes, the 20 different elements that are represented over the 20 days come to their fullest fruition in the, in the yellow sun. It's the last day, and then we start again tomorrow in what we call red dragon or the crocodile, the womb of the crocodile deep in the oceanic depths of the of the great mother this is the rising to pure light which is kind of like when we die we rise to light so it's the total realization of life the 
fulfillment and anything that we've said is to me blazed in sunlight because of the day. Mm-hmm. So it is a it's a great day to feel enlightened and come out of the shadows. And you know the way I teach, especially to people who aren't in Santa Barbara, is through my website, which is resonanttruth.com. Resonant, as so we are always resonant, psychic, soulful beings held within our physical body. And truth, obviously, I've been concerned with truth on all levels for a long time. So at Resonant Truth, which also has its counterpart on Facebook, I post a little astrological hit each day, a fortune, and you can read about the day's energy there. And I also podcast because spoken word to me is so freeing after being inhibited in my physical body from being shaken up so young that I do a lot of speaking, not just writing. So I podcast every day and I also have a weekly online radio program that airs Sunday mornings to kind of rev us up astrologically and anchor us in our healing path. It's called the 13th Moon Recovery Hour, and it's a play on words that we are reclaiming a 13th month in the year instead of having 12. But it's sort of subliminally and secretly a place for me to really talk about recovery on this level of healing. I say that recovery is just Getting, recovering things, getting back parts that I lost in really unsettling situations. So I always like to let people know if they're on a different recovery path that we can all com- come together in communion on Sundays. And I've written a book that I came up with and that's posted on my website. It's, it's just as recent as this spring, and it's called Natural Time, a guidebook to the Maya calendars, and it's definitely a primer on the deep path that come out of the Maya. I make calendars. I mean, it's just a lot that I'm able to do because I've found my bliss. So it's all pretty much promoted on Resonant Truth. And you can always contact me through that website if you want a reading on your own birth astrology. And to look at some of these family patterns together, it's my expertise and my gift as a storm to bring clarity to your own situation. Awesome. And I'll, um, I'm going to post this on my blog, and I'll have a link um, on under the the recording to uh, to your website, so people can just find it more easily. So if you're listening oh, to this right you. now on my website, there is a link to Lisa's website to Resonant Truth. <laughs> you can look your birthday up. You can find your birthday out right away. That's always how I encourage people to begin with yourself heart of yourself and self-love and self-understanding. So you can punch in your Gregorian birth date and get your Mayan birthday right away. Yeah, that's what I did. And um, I really love, you know, find, having found out about my energy and knowing that, you know, this is really the, the blue night, which I am, is really the, the, the safe place for people to come to, to go into the dream time. And, and for me, that means, you know, people can come to me and heal. So I love that, you know, having that confirmation that that's what I'm here to do, helping, you know, providing the space for people to go deep. So Yeah, you are. <laughs> people can know that Carolyn's birth energy is about creating the gathering to to honor the, the dream, like the, the surreal part of ourselves, the psyche inside the physical body. And she's all about, you're all about creating communion and collective healing around that, that we don't stay alone in isolation, that we celebrate the heroic journey we've been on and that we are now back home after going off on our individual paths and it's time to have our, you know, celebration of what we were we used to be afraid of but we were overcoming. Thank you so much, Lisa, for helping me create a community today on this call and um, helping me provide space and um, sharing your wisdom. And, um, yeah, I'm just very grateful to having had you on this call. Thank you for letting me heal (laughs) so publicly. (laughs) 